I'm Dave Collins with CleverHiker.com. In this episode, we're going to take a look at some of the most important first aid skills for the backcountry. Knowing what to do in an emergency when you're miles away from help is just about as important as backpacking skills get. You'll hopefully never have to use them, but emergency first aid skills could save your life or save the life of your hiking partner, so don't overlook them. It needs to be said though, that there's really no way to learn all of these critical skills by watching a short video. We can give you the key information, but we can't give you the practice and instruction that you'll need to have had in a wilderness emergency. That's why I highly recommend taking a wilderness first aid course to get the experience that you need to be properly prepared. There are a few things to remember in every emergency situation, the most important of which is to remain calm. Your ability to assess the situation rationally, develop an emergency plan, and deal with the circumstances confidently is crucial to your success. Before your trip, talk with your group about the best way to handle emergency situations and how to utilize any tools that are available to your group. You should also know what your options are for getting help. You could send a hiker for assistance or use a cell phone, emergency beacon, or a satellite phone to call for help. In an emergency situation, reduce your exposure, stay warm, and stay hydrated. If there's an injured member in your group, don't leave them alone if at all possible. Prevent the spread of disease and infection by taking precautionary measures like washing your hands and wearing protective gloves if there's a chance of touching blood or other body fluids. CPR is an emergency procedure performed on people experiencing cardiac arrest. The primary purpose of CPR is to provide oxygenated blood flow to the brain until the patient's breathing and heartbeat can be restored. In order to be properly prepared to give CPR, I highly recommend that you take a certified CPR course to learn the correct skills. Before you approach any victim, it's important to scan the scene and make sure that you won't be putting yourself in danger as well. The first step in CPR is to check and see if a person is unresponsive and not breathing or breathing abnormally. If the person is not breathing or breathing abnormally, call for help or send someone to call for help and start CPR immediately. Roll the person on their back and begin chest compressions immediately. Even if you're not confident enough to perform the breathing part of CPR, you should still perform the chest compressions, which are a very important part of keeping someone alive. Place the heel of your hand on the center of the victim's chest and put your other hand over top of it, interlacing your fingers. You want to compress the chest about 2 inches deep 30 times. Pump hard and fast at a rate of about 100 compressions per minute. The song Staying Alive by the Bee Gees is a good reminder of the beat that you want to follow. After 30 compressions, open the victim's airway by lifting the chin and tilting the head back. Pinch the victim's nose, cover their mouth with your own, and blow until you see the chest rise. Give two quick breaths, lasting about one second each. Continue with 30 more chest compressions and two breaths until help arrives or you can no longer perform CPR due to exhaustion. Hypothermia happens when a person's core body temperature falls below normal levels, which can happen when a person is exposed to cold temperatures, wind, and wetness. Hypothermia is one of the most dangerous emergency conditions that can happen in the outdoors and one of the main causes of death to backcountry travelers. For that reason, it's incredibly important to take the signs of hypothermia very seriously and to treat it quickly. Improper planning, inadequate protection from exposure, and poor hydration and nutrition can all lead to increased chances of hypothermia. The first sign of hypothermia is shivering, which is a symptom of the body trying to warm itself. Shivering might start mildly, then become more aggressive, and eventually it'll stop altogether. Another sign of hypothermia is referred to as having the umbles, meaning the mumbles, stumbles, fumbles, and grumbles. Hypothermia victims may slur their speech, become confused, lose their coordination, and will eventually become apathetic and irrational. To treat hypothermia, get the victim out of the elements, get them dry, and warm their core body temperature as soon as possible. 
Get the victim into their shelter and replace their wet base layers with dry clothing. If the victim is conscious, feed them caloric drinks and food to boost their metabolism and have them exercise in short bursts to generate heat, but make sure they avoid all alcohol and caffeine. If the victim is unconscious, be very careful when moving them because their heart will be sensitive and don't try to feed them food or drinks because they might choke. Put them in a sleeping bag on top of a pad to insulate them from the cold ground and if possible, wrap them in a tarp or plastic sheet to increase the insulation of the bag. Sharing body heat with skin-to-skin -skin contact can be a good way to warm up a hypothermic victim as well. Warm up a hypothermia victim's core first, not their hands and feet, because that will circulate cold blood back to their core. Heat exhaustion is a condition that happens in hot climates when a person's body is unable to cool itself. Heat exhaustion can happen when temperatures and humidity levels are high and your body's working hard. Dehydration can make matters a lot worse, but you might experience heat exhaustion even if you are drinking water. Heat exhaustion is not life-threatening, but if it goes untreated, it can lead to heat stroke, which can damage the brain and lead to death. Symptoms of heat exhaustion include profuse sweating, pale skin, weakness, nausea, vomiting, headaches, and muscle cramps. To treat heat exhaustion, get the victim to a cool, shady location and let them rest. Lay them down and elevate their legs slightly. Give the victim sips of cool water or an electrolyte solution and help them to cool down with a wet bandana on their forehead. If a victim is experiencing heat stroke, their skin will often be red hot to the touch, and dry. Other symptoms of heat stroke include nausea, vomiting, rapid breathing and heartbeat, throbbing headaches, confusion, and unconsciousness. When a victim is experiencing heat stroke, their body needs to be cooled immediately, and they need to get to medical attention as soon as possible. Get them to a shady area, remove their clothing, and actively try to cool their body with cold water and wet clothes. Focus on their head, neck, armpits, and groin. If possible, have the victim drink sips of cool water or an electrolyte solution and get them out to medical help as soon as you can. Knowing how to properly treat minor wounds and burns in the field will allow you to hike out safely without having any lasting effects. For abrasions, scrub the wound with soap and a clean gauze pad to remove any dirt from the wound. Then rinse off the soap, cover a gauze pad with antibiotic ointment, and tape it in place to keep the wound clean. The same procedure should be used for minor cuts. If the cut's bleeding a lot, use a clean gauze pad to apply pressure to the area for about 10 minutes, which should help stop the bleeding. Use butterfly bandages to close any large cuts, and cover the wound with a gauze pad to keep it clean until you can get out to medical attention. For small burns, immediately put the limb in cold water or cover it with a water-soaked bandana. Keep it cool until the pain is reduced, then cover it with a gauze pad. And don't pop any blisters if they form. Instead, try to keep blisters from popping for as long as possible because the skin under the blister is raw and healing. For second and third degree burns that cover a large surface area, don't immerse the burn site in water because that can cause shock. Cover a large, serious burn with a cool, moist bandage and lift it above heart level if possible. Then get the victim out to medical help. If clothing is ever burned along with the skin, don't pull it off because that can pull the skin off too. If the burn site is small enough, you may be able to pull off the burned clothing after the wound is cooled. With a heavy bleeding wound, the most important concern is to stop the bleeding and get the victim out to help as soon as possible. If you can, wash your hands and wear vinyl gloves to reduce the chances of infection when dealing with a heavy bleeding wound. Cover the victim to prevent them from losing body heat and lift the legs slightly along with the wound site. Remove any dirt and debris from the wound, but don't remove any large or deeply embedded objects. Apply pressure directly to the wound site to stop the bleeding. Use sterile bandages or clean clothes and hold pressure on there for about 20 minutes without lifting up to see if the bleeding has stopped. Don't remove the gauze or bandages. If the bandages get soaked through with blood, Add more absorbent bandages on top and continue to put pressure on the wound. If you're still having trouble stopping the bleeding, locate the nearest artery and place pressure on it with your fingers. With your other hand, keep the pressure on the wound. 
Pressure points for your arm are just above the elbow and just below the inside of your armpit. In your leg, the pressure points are in the groin and just behind the knee. Immobilize the victim's injured body part once the bleeding has stopped, keeping the bandages in place, and get them out to medical help. For sprains in the backcountry, the RICE method still applies and is very effective. Rest, ice, compression, elevation. Rest the sprain limb and then ice it with snow or cold water. Ice it for 20 minutes on and then 20 minutes off. Compress the wound with an elastic bandage and elevate it to keep the swelling down. After a few icing cycles, you'll probably be okay to walk out. Use anti-inflammatory medications like naproxen sodium and ibuprofen to reduce the swelling and ease the pain. You can also use a makeshift crutch to help you walk out and keep weight off the limb. A break can sometimes be hard to diagnose. If the injury is painful, swollen, and can't be used, then treat it like a break and splint it. The best way to treat a break in the backcountry is to immobilize it with a splint so it doesn't move around and do more damage. Then get the victim out to medical help. To make a splint, improvise by using materials from your backpack and your surroundings. Sleeping pads, trekking poles, sticks, and extra clothing can all be used to make effective splints. In most cases, it's best to leave the fractured limb in the position you found it. But if you're out in the backcountry and you're many hours or days away from help, you may have to reset the limb before you can transport the victim. First, stop any bleeding if present. If the break is protruding, you'll need to push the limb back into place to stop bleeding and prevent infection. Once the limb is in the anatomically correct position, it'll cause less pain and do less damage. Then you can focus on splinting the limb and getting the victim out to help. If a victim may have a spinal cord injury from a fall or a blow to the head, it's important not to move the victim unless absolutely necessary. Keep the victim still and prevent their head from moving until help arrives. Provide basic first aid, including CPR if necessary, but don't lift the head or neck. If you absolutely have to move a victim because they're vomiting, choking, or they're in other danger, then use another person and try and keep their head, neck, and back aligned while you roll them on their side. Shock is a condition that can accompany trauma, blood loss, heat stroke, an allergic reaction, and other ailments. It can lead to permanent organ damage and eventually death. A person experiencing shock will have cool and clammy skin. Their blood pressure will be low and they'll have a weak and rapid pulse. They may also have shallow, rapid breathing. The victim might be weak, with vacant eyes, and they might be confused and disoriented as well. Shock victims might also be nauseous and they could vomit. When a person is in shock, it's important to get them medical help as soon as possible. Call for help or send a member of your party to go get help. If someone is in shock, lay them down and lift their feet about a foot off the ground unless their head, neck, back, or legs are injured. You never want to lift their head and the focus is to keep the blood in the vital organs. Check for signs of breathing and begin CPR if necessary. If the victim is vomiting or bleeding from their mouth, roll them on their side to prevent choking. Treat any obvious injuries like heavy bleeding or broken bones as soon as the person is stable. Keep the victim warm and comfortable by covering them with a sleeping bag and reducing any restrictive clothing. Don't give the victim anything to eat or drink. Keep them still and wait for help to arrive. Remember, the key to emergency first aid is being properly prepared, staying calm, determining an emergency plan, and acting efficiently. Hopefully you'll never have to use wilderness first aid skills, but if you do, it'll be important that you have the correct knowledge and preparation. That's why I highly recommend that you take a wilderness first aid course to get certified for emergency situations. I'm Dave Collins for CleverHiker.com. Hike light, hike smart, and have fun.